Hey everyone, I'm now so in confused. I'm Claire Saffitz? No, this is, what do I say? I'm Claire Saffitz, okay, all right. Hey everyone, I'm Claire Saffitz, welcome to my kitchen. Today we have an episode of Clarified and typically we pick a theme for Clarified, maybe it's baking questions or it's holiday questions or you know summer baking questions, um, but today is Ask Me Anything. So. Vinny put together a list of questions. What did you like Instagram at or something? What did you put? Community board. Community board on YouTube? YouTube. Okay, so people wrote in. So we have a whole list of questions. It's gonna cover topics, not just food and baking. So let's see, I haven't really seen all of them. But let's get started. Brandon asks, what is your least favorite ingredient to work with, whether it be in cooking or baking? I think there's two ways to look at that question. One way would be like, what's your least favorite ingredient, you know, for taste or texture? And then what's your least favorite ingredient to actually like work with and handle? There's very few things where I'm like, I don't eat this thing or I don't like this thing, but I really don't like sundry tomatoes. Just don't like it. I don't like the flavor and I don't really want to eat them and I will pick them out. That's kind of the only thing that comes to mind you know, chocolate can be like a tricky ingredient to work with, but it, but I like it. It's not, um, I don't dislike it at all, but it can be, you know, sort of temperamental. I think that's it. There's kind of no ingredient that I won't really work with. Brittany writes, Hi Claire, when making and maintaining a sourdough starter, is it best to keep it on the counter at room temp or keep it in the fridge? Also, what is the best flour to use for starter slash the actual loaf? Okay, so if I were a bakery producing dozens of loaves a day, I would keep my starter on the counter at room temperature. And that is because at room temperature, the yeast and bacteria are very active and it is going to ripen quickly. But for the average home baker who's not baking every day in large quantities, you wanna keep it in the fridge to slow everything down. So it's really about like production and frequency of baking. And for most home bakers who are not baking all the time, keeping it in the fridge is best because you're slowing down the activity and you're not having to feed it as often. If you were to keep your starter at room temp, you would have to feed it every day, go through a ton of flour, go through a ton of discard, and it's just wasteful. So keeping it in the fridge is best. And as far as the best flour to use, I can't kind of give you one blanket recommendation because it depends on the style of bread you're making. But generally speaking, like if you're using a, a rye flour or a whole wheat flour, that is going to encourage activity in your starter. So you can kind of deploy that as needed. So if you feel like your starter is kind of sluggish or you haven't fed it in a while, giving it some whole wheat or rye flour in you know, some proportion of the, whole, of the total flour will help to enliven it. This question is from JJ. Best must have baking slash kitchen supplies. Great question. I'm kind of a fan of like smaller little baking tools. So a good rolling pin is essential. I don't just use it for rolling out dough. I use it for like crushing up nuts and making cookie crumb crusts and stuff like that. A small offset spatula, a set of flexible silicone spatulas for like scraping bowls are really important and you'll use them all the time. A bench scraper and a bowl scraper. These are all really inexpensive items, but really, really important in the kitchen. I think also having an instant read thermometer is really important. That can be super handy for all sorts of cooking and baking tasks. So these are kind of smaller items that you can add to your collection. And then of course, just a set of basic bakeware that's like an anodized aluminum is really helpful for cake pans or loaf pans and some ceramic baking dishes. Those will really kind of help you to make like a, a, a wide number of baked goods. And then also I would just recommend a couple of aluminum half sheet trays. Those are workhorses, you'll use them constantly. Raphael asks, are you ever going to do a reaction video of your parody made by Novimpia? I think I saw this and I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> I was like, is that me? First of all, her makeup looks amazing. I'm flattered. <laughs> and her eyebrows. There's a saying, what grows together goes together. Also, um, if it smells like crap, it might be a trap. <laughs> the very reactions I get from these desserts is incredible. My mom tried this one and she was like, oh my God, that's really bad. Then she tried <laughs> this one, and she was like, "Oh my God, that's not bad." I'm gonna, I'm gonna go. <laughs> Amazing! I'm gonna watch it every night before I go to sleep. I feel so flattered. Hair, makeup, incredible. Like, teach me, teach me your tricks. Okay, Madison, why does my custard always split? I do like that people wrote in like actual pastry questions. This is great. 
Okay, so the custard splitting. By splitting, I, I think what you mean is possibly like curdling, like it's overcooking and you're getting a kind of like lumpy texture in your custard. My guess is it could be the cookware that you're using. So if you're working in cookware that's kind of has like thin sides and a thin bottom, it's really, really easy for custard to overcook. So I would say decrease your heat. You could also try cooking the custard in a double boiler. So you have like your saucepan and you have water in the bottom and then your custard is in a bowl that's set on top. So that's a gentler way to cook it. You're much, it's gonna take longer, but you're much less likely to curdle it. Um, that's probably what's happening. Unless you're using some kind of like really crazy, fresh, special dairy that maybe is prone to breaking or that kind of thing. My guess is your heat in your cookware. <laughs> Jamie writes, the real question is, when are we getting the drunk making episode? Three million subscribers. <laughs> it sounds fun. I, I mean, I'm happy to wait until then, but it sounds good, okay. Mauricio writes, what's it like cooking on induction after coming from a gas stove? Was there a learning curve from a purely cooking point of view? Do you prefer one from the other or do they function about the same? What I love about induction is it's so precise and so easy to control. And you like, if, I, if you're cooking a creme anglaise or a lemon curd, like it's so easy to kind of dial in the heat. So um, that's what I really like it for. Plus it's so easy to clean. With, with gas, I think it's a little bit harder to modulate your heat. You know, there's some things with gas that you can't really replicate. Like I love with a gas stove, you can like char an eggplant or a pepper directly on the stove. So obviously you can't do that here, but there's a lot of um, bonuses and benefits of induction. So I would say overall on the balance, I'm actually kind of more into induction. Um, and there is a learning curve going from one to the other. And I mean, there's a learning curve with any new stove of any kind. You have to sort of learn the quirks and how the heating works. Yeah. Love it. Okay, so Tom's question is, hi Claire, I love your chocolate forever brownie recipe from your first cookbook. What is your favorite chocolate forward recipe in the new cookbook? Great question. I have actually more chocolate in the new cookbook that I did in Dessert Person. And I'm like, I like chocolate, but I'm a little bit particular about my chocolate desserts. But I really wanted to like explore the genre in what's for dessert. And so I love the chocolate coupes. It's just like a very classic chocolate pudding. Check out that episode. I also really love the chocolate souffles. It's a really special recipe. It's kind of like a little, a little, baking miracle that you can make, and it's not that hard. Dessert person memes. Will Saucy ever be on dessert people? Or Vinny? I would love to see him bake with you. Trying to get Vinny on the side of the camera. He's being a little reluctant. I would love that. I'm actually trying to switch places with him. While I'm behind the camera. Saucy, I would love to be on dessert people. My mom is the best and a great baker. Saucy, call me. <laughs> she already does. <laughs> I'll call you, mom. Leah writes, hi Claire, this may be a silly question, but when making desserts or other fried food, what do you do with the frying oil afterward? Can it be reused? How do you dispose of it? I've always wanted to take a shot at making donuts, but I always hesitate because I don't know what to do with the oil when I'm done. Such a good question. You can reuse oil, fryer oil, you know, up to a couple times. So if the oil still smells okay and the color looks pretty much like it did when it came out of the, uh, out of the bottle, you can reuse it. It depends on what you're cooking. Like if you're frying fish, it's probably not oil you can reuse because the flavor will go off. But if you're making donuts, it's very likely that you'll be able to reuse the oil. So what you want to do is let it cool in the pot, strain it. I often strain it back into the container in which it came, like a, you know, if I buy like a 32 ounce thing of oil and then store it in a cool dark place, you can reuse it. You want to stop using the oil when it starts to smell a little bit acrid. The color will darken, the texture will thicken and it will get almost like a sticky consistency. And you kind of know that you're done when the when you when you add food to the oil and it starts to foam rather than like bubble. So that's kind of when your oil is done. And to dispose of it, the best thing to do is to let it cool, pour it into a container with a lid, and there are recycling centers where you can take used cooking oil. Sometimes a restaurant will take it and dispose of it for you because they have someone to pick up the oil and reuse it. If that's not an option, then you can just throw it in the garbage. That's how you do it. All right, so Tati asks, once I saw the subtitle for the new book, I remembered a conversation you had with Aaron Goyaga October last year, where you talk about the concept of simple. You've already touched on it, but can you elaborate on what simple means to you, especially in regards to this new book? Is it synonymous with easy or are those different things? Can you achieve complex results, rich flavors, textures, etc., with a so-called simple recipe? Wow, Tati, have you like gone in my brain and like <laughs> extracted this like core concept of the book? Because it sounds like it. So to me, simple refers to the process, which to me means as streamlined as possible. So you're getting from point A to point Z as quickly as possible with the fewest number of steps. And it also means that the thing that you are creating kind of presents as itself. So it is 
there is a kind of like straightforwardness to the flavors and to the presentation and it's not overwrought or fussy or too complicated. That's what I think all the recipes in the book really achieve, even though there's still a range of difficulty. Like some things feel easier than others, but I think they're all simple, actually. Even when it's like a donut or something with more steps involved. Okay. I'm not answering that last question. <laughs> I always enjoy reading and answering your questions on Dessert Person. We're happy to bring you more episodes of Clarified. I just did kind of like a kitchen tour of everything that we built in this space. So if you have any questions about your kitchen, organization, tools, baking equipment, um, cookware, any of that, please ask me. You can leave them in the comments below. So let us know and thank you for watching and don't forget to like and subscribe.